what type of plane you fly back then, a DC-8, a 707. Of course, I didn't know that, and I thought, what type of equipment? Well, the equipment I'm on is a stool. They must mean what type of equipment is on the planes I fly. So I thought, well, they have the wing, they have the engine. They always had a sticker on the engine, who manufactured the engine. So I said, yes, General Electric. All three pilots kind of just stopped eating, leaned over. The captain said, oh, really? What do you fly, washing machines? I knew I said the wrong thing, out the door I went. Everybody had an airline ID card, plastic, laminated card, much like a driver's license today. Yet without the ID card, the uniform was worthless. I went back to Manhattan pretty discouraged, thinking where would I come up with a Pan American airline corporate ID? I was sitting in a hotel room, I noticed a big, thick Manhattan yellow page was on the dresser, so I pulled them down on the bed, flipped them open, and looked under the word identification. There were three or four pages of companies who made convention badges, metal badges, plastic badges, police badges, fire badges. I started to call around and finally one company said, listen, most of those airline IDs manufactured by Polaroid, 3M company, need to call one of them. Finally got the 3M company on the phone in Manhattan. Yeah, we manufacture Pan Am's identification system along with a number of other carriers. How come? So I tell you, I'm a purchasing officer for a major U.S. carrier. I'm in New York just for the day, getting ready to expand our routes, hire a lot of employees, go to a formal ID. We're very impressed with this Pan Am format. I wondered if I came by your office this afternoon briefly, we could discuss quantity and price. By all means, come on by. So I went by dressed in a suit, and the sales rep opened the book. Yeah, we do United, Delta, Eastern, Pan Am, Pan Am. We like this format. Wonder if you might have a sample I could bring back. Sure, I'll be right back. And he brought me back a five by seven glossy piece of paper with a picture of an ID card blown up in the middle of it, someone else's picture in the picture, John Doe for a name, and in bold running across the front, this is a sample only. I said, no, I'm afraid this will do. You know, I need to bring back an actual physical card. And by the way, what is all this equipment on the floor? Oh, no, we don't just sell this car. We sell the system, camera, laminate. I say, we'd have to buy all of this. Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what, since we have to buy it all, why don't you just demonstrate it works and use me? Fine, never see right here. I was going down the elevator studying the car, and I had a blue border across the top, about a quarter of an inch in Pan Am's color blue, but not a single thing on the card said Pan Am. No logo, no insignia, no company name. This was a plastic card like a credit card. You couldn't type on it, couldn't write on it, couldn't print on it. Discouraged, I put it in my pocket, headed back to the hotel. As I was walking back, I noticed I had passed a hobby shop, so I turned around and walked back. Uh, excuse me, so I see you sell a lot of models. Here you sell models of commercial jetliners. Show over there. And I bought a model of a Pan Am 707 cargo jet for about $2.40. Took it back to my room, opened the box, threw all the parts out. But there at the bottom of the box was a sheet of decals that went on the model. And when soaked in a glass of water, the little Pan Am logo, the blue globe that would have went on the tail of the plastic plane, went perfect up at the top of the plastic car. And the word Pan Am and the special styling of graphics that would have went on the fuselage went perfect across the top of the car. And the clear decal on the laminated plastic made a beautiful identification card. Pan Am says they estimate that between the ages of 16 and 18, I flew more than a million miles for free, boarded more than 250 commercial aircraft in more than 26 countries. Pan Am says keep in mind that though Frank Abagnale did in fact pose as one of our pilots, he never once stepped on board one of our aircraft. That's true. I never flew on Pan Am because I was afraid someone might say to me, you know I'm based in San Francisco, been out there 21 years. I don't recall ever meeting you before. Or someone might say, you know, your ID card. Not exactly like my ID card. <laughs> so instead, I flew on everyone else. If I wanted to go somewhere, I literally just walked out to the airport, looked up on the board, United Flight 800 to Chicago. Then I went downstairs to the door marked United Operations and walked in. The operations clerk, hey, Pan Am, what can we do for you? I was wondering if the jump seats open on 800 needed to in Chicago. Jump seat, open this evening, I'd like to get a pink slip pass. I'd give my ID, grant me out a pass, I'd walk out, hand it to the flight attendant, she'd open the door to the cockpit, and I'd step in. They had a captain, a co pilot, a flight engineer, and a seat behind the captain called the jump seat, where pilots did head on company time. And because pilots love to talk shop, once you picked up that jargon, it was the same conversation over and over. <laughs> so I just step on board, named Jeff Bob Davis, be right in Chicago. On the taxi out, always the same question. So Bob, how long have you been with Pan Am? Been flying about seven years. What position do you fly? 
a right seat, which is airline terminology for a co-pilot. What type of equipment are you on? Had that one down. <laughs> Matter of fact, whatever they flew, I didn't fly, so I had no problem with that. <laughs> when I arrived in Chicago, I'd go by the Pan Am ticket counter, but just enough to get the attention of the passenger service rep. Uh, sir, help you? Excuse me, where do we lay over here? They did a trip for somebody got ill, never laid over in Chicago. Uh, so we was in Parma House Hilton, downtown, catch a crew bus, lower level door, three out. I'd go down to Parma House Hilton, walk in, and on the corner of the registration desk was a little sign that said, Airline crews. That was a three ring binder. You signed in, referenced your flight number, showed your ID, they'd give me a key, I'd stay two or three days, and Pan Am would be direct bill for my room and my meal. <laughs> I also could cash a personal check up at the front desk because the airline had a contract with the hotel and as a courtesy of cash your check up to $100. But then I found out that every airline honors every other airline, employs personal check. A reciprocal agreement still practiced today in 2012 so that a Delta flight attendant at the Austin airport can walk over to the American ticket counter, show her Delta ID, and cash a personal check up to $100 and vice versa. Of course, when I found that out, I'd go out to JFK, LAX, only I'd go to everybody, Northeast, National, <laughs> Canada, <laughs> taking a good eight hours stopping at every counter and every building. By the time I got all the way around the other end of the airport, at least eight hours had gone by. And what do you have in eight hours? Shift change, new people, so I go all the way around. <laughs> I made a great deal of money. The only reason I quit at 18 is the FBI issued a John Doe warrant for interstate transportation of fraudulent checks, a federal offense. The John Doe warrant meant the FBI didn't know my identity. In the warrant, the FBI said based on interviews with people I had contact with, I was approximately 30 years old. I was 18, had a great deal of money, so I hung the uniform up and moved to Atlanta, Georgia. And in Atlanta, I moved into a very swank singles complex that had just been built there called the Riverbend Apartments. On the application for the lease, there were a lot of questions for a teenage boy. One was occupation. I began to write down airline pilot, but the next question said employed by supervisor's name, telephone contact. I thought to myself, I'll need to come up with something that would be impossible to check out. Yet something that would justify why I drive an expensive car, wear expensive clothes, don't work much. So I wrote down the word doctor. First thing came to my mind, nothing else. But I had a very inquisitive apartment manager. Oh, I see you, you're a doctor. Uh, yes, ma'am. What type of doctor are you? Well, I'm a, um, I'm a medical doctor. <laughs> However, I'm not practicing medicine right now. I left my practice out in Los Angeles to come to Atlanta to invest in some real estate I have. So I won't be practicing for a while. How interesting. Well, tell me, what type of medical doctor are you? And I figured, being a singles complex, pediatrician would be pretty safe. So I moved in, Dr. Frank Williams, pediatrician. Everybody called me doc, always the typical questions at the pool. So doc, where do you go to medical school? Uh, Columbia University, New York. Where do you serve your internship? The Harvard Children's Hospital, out in LA. Once in a while, when the guys would come by, hey Paul, hey Doc, look at my leg. I don't know what I did to it. Look at this. Uh, Paul, I can't examine your leg. You need to go to your own doctor and look at that. When the girls came by, I always gave them a thorough examination. <laughs> I was young, but not stupid. I was living there for about two or three months. Everything was going great. One afternoon, there was a knock on the door. A very distinguished gentleman, mid 50s, standing there. Is here to help you? You were Dr. Williams? Yes? My name's Gordon. Just moved in the apartment down below. Wanted to come up and introduce myself. I'm your neighbor. Come on in. Well, I understand that you're a pediatrician. Yes, I'm the chief resident pediatrician of the county hospital up the street. Dr. Gordon was going through a divorce, just separated from his wife. He was very upset, very lonely. Every day on the way to the pool, out to the tennis court, out to the car, he'd stop you. And after a minute or two about the weather, he'd start speaking medical terminology. Not being able to converse with him, I in turn would cut him short. But I knew eventually he'd get suspicious. Determined not to move, every day I went to Emory University's medical library. Every day I read the daily journals from Johns Hopkins, the Mayo Clinic. Every day I took a certain part of the journal, memorized it to detail, and every night when Dr. Gordon pulled in his parking slot, and this is without exaggeration, every night I was sitting on his doorstep. Hey, Doc, hey, about this new theory they're using up at Mayo. Uh, what is it tonight? Aggravated, he'd go into his apartment. I'd follow him in. If he went to his bedroom to get undressed, I'd go in his bedroom and sit on the edge of the bed. If he in the kitchen, I'd follow him back and forth. Go to the bathroom, I'd talk through the door. Pretty soon he'd come home, hey doc, I don't have time to talk to you right now, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> One afternoon I received a phone call from the hospital administrator 